Uh, tonight we'll hear from Dr. Karen Gedge on the life and times of Rebecca Lugans. Dr. Gedge holds a PhD in American Studies from Yale University. She's been teaching at Westchester University in the History Department and the Secondary Education Department since 1997. Her teaching and research interests include women in America, religion in America, and teaching secondary social studies. So let's welcome Dr. Gedge. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I do want to say that uh, we're going to talk about Rebecca Lukens, her life and times, but the emphasis might be more on her times and other women who lived during that time period rather than on Rebecca herself. But we'll, I, what I want to do is to spend time kind of comparing uh, Rebecca with other women who lived at the time. I am absolutely certain that there are people in this audience who know more about Rebecca than I do. And uh, because I'm a participatory uh, speaker, I don't want to stand up here and lecture the whole time. I invite you to um, correct me if I am making um, misstatements about Rebecca or, or anybody else um, and to ask questions. I think we'll still have time to get through all of my slides even if we uh, have some discussion in between. Um, so please feel free to interrupt me. That is great. I know you're paying attention if you're interrupting me. So, uh, how extraordinary was she is the controversial essential question that we're going to try to answer. And I'm going to give you a lot of information and then ask you at the end to make your own judgment. How extraordinary was she? Um, and so if you're bringing your own knowledge about Rebecca, please do that. Um, and I'm going to try to provide some context for her life. So uh, this group, uh, this is the Clark sisters, and as far as I can tell, yes, this was taken somewhere between 1840 and 1850, but this has become a very iconic photograph of women in the early 19th century. And um, I, you know, had to size the slide. I probably could have made it any, a, little, a bit bigger. But the one thing you're supposed to notice here are those 15, 16, 17 inch waists that these women, there's a mother here and four daughters, um, that they, you know, they have these very tight corsets and very elaborate hairdos actually. They spent a lot of time on this. So they kind of fit our stereotype of what 19th century American women, early 19th century American women should look like. I don't know too much about the Clark <laughs> sisters, but I imagine um, given their clothing that they were fairly prosperous and wealthy and had time to live up to the ideal of womanhood that was actually being created during this time period. Um, as men moved out into uh, factories and offices and clerks and took, had more participation in politics, women were supposed to stay home and take care of the home. I spend a lot of time in my Women in America class trying to get my students to reject the uh, stereotype that all women before the last, you know, 20 or 30 years stayed home, cooked, clean, and took care of the um, children. That it was never true then, and um, it's even less true now. So what we want to do is look at uh, Rebecca for a few minutes and talk about how truly extraordinary she was, but then compare her to other women of her time period. So uh, I'm going to read just a little bit here so I don't make too many mistakes, and then I'm just going to talk from the slides. Um, Rebecca <coughs> Lukens was an extraordinary woman by almost any measure. She was a founder of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, 
She invested in a family business that produced the building blocks of the new economy. The iron that was molded into rails for railroads and boilerplates that sheathe steam engines, steamships, and steam locomotives. It's hard to identify an industry more central to the new industrial economy, and Rebecca Lukens was right at the center of that very successful business at the start of this um, industrialization period. That all, all alone makes her extraordinary. Um, the fact that she was also a builder, not she, she didn't just participate in this economy, she was a builder in this industry. She engineered the investments in new technology and infrastructure in her business. She was looking at long-term payoffs, not short-term profits while she was doing this investment. Um, she and her husband, Dr. Lukens, went deep into debt to purchase the family the business from family members and who sometimes opposed her. In fact, there were legal suits for a long time um, that uh, challenged her ability to own and run this business. After Dr. Lukens' death, she struggled to fulfill her commitment to the ironworks, took over the reins of the financial side of the business. She paid off the debts, invested in buildings and equipment to make the iron she also invested in her workers, uh, providing them with housing and wages and food, even during the depths of the Depression in 1837. That makes her pretty extraordinary, too. Uh, what makes her even more remarkable is that, yes, her gender. She was a woman. She self-identified as a woman, as we say today. <laughs> she was a woman who stepped outside of the boundaries of the rigid gender roles prescribed for women in the New Republic. Her business was <coughs> inextricable from the prosperity of her family. And in some ways, I think that allowed her to step out of her uh, sphere because it was a family business, and she was doing it um, for her family and her local community. Um, I think that was, that was her justification to herself and maybe to her community. Made it easier for her to cross the, recross the boundaries between the feminine domestic sphere and the masculine commercial sphere. So the question I want to explore with you tonight is, Exactly how did Rebecca Lukens compare to her sisters <coughs> across the nation in uh, no matter where they lived uh, or their so socioeconomic status? All of them were affected by the big um, factors that shaped men's and women's lives during this time period. Um, so if we just look and compare the Clark sisters with Rebecca, there are two images of Rebecca. She does not fit the stereotype. She is probably more the real than the ideal. Um, and so in some ways, that makes her more ordinary. Um, but if we compare her to a lot of other women who lived at this time, um, I think we'll see similarities and differences. Um, surely, she was an, ed an educated young woman. That made her extraordinary. Very few young women had access to the level of schooling that she had. Um, her, lots of women were religious, probably more religious than men at the time. Um, but because she was a member of the Society of Friends, or Quakers, that made her pretty unusual. That was a pretty tiny group, powerful group in this region, but overall it was a pretty tiny group. It put her in a, in a minority. Um, but you can tell from this image of her as a young woman that um, this doesn't fit the stereotype of plain Quaker dress. This is actually a, a pretty prosperous young woman. And the fact that she's holding a book is another way that this portrait symbolizes her, her education. But she's modest, right? And she's very serious. And in, in almost all of the, the images, she's very serious. 
So the forces shaping the lives of U.S. women in Rebecca's lifetime were, I'm going to take them in this order, westward expansion, uh, the first industrial revolution, increased immigration, slavery and abolitionism, and Jacksonian democracy. Uh, westward expansion, uh, U.S. government and uh, the relentless force of white Americans moving west. Um, in this case, I'm just going to talk about uh, the, the pressure on Native Americans to move out of their homelands in the east. So the most uh, infamous example of this is the Trail of Tears. Uh, that was the forced migration of Native American families um, from east to west and on to reservations, uh, which began in 1838-39. Um, but even closer to home in uh, Chester County, we have the example of Indian Hannah. Has anyone um, passed the, the memorials to Indian Hannah? Um, there's a good new book out on, um, on her. Uh, she was memorialized as the last of the Lenape Indians in Chester County, but in fact she was not the, the last. But she was coming to the end of her life just at the time when um, Rebecca was growing up in this area. Who knows, they could have met each other. They, they were that close in, in the region. Um, but Hannah had a very different life than uh, Rebecca would grow up to have. Uh, without the support of family and tribal members, Hannah Freeman ended her days here in Chester County. They built a new almshouse here, a poor house, and Hannah was one of the first inmates at the almshouse. And when she died a few years later, she was buried in a pauper's grave. Uh, Indian women not only lost their land and their livelihoods, they lost power and status in their traditional cultures. In contrast, Rebecca was able to live her life and raise her family on the land uh, where she grew up herself and she gained wealth and status and power in her <coughs> culture. So when we compare her to um, Native American women of the time, it's quite a dramatic contrast. So the first industrial revolution, yes, we should definitely think about uh, the iron industry. But uh, in fact, the first um, factories, <coughs> large-scale factories in, during the first industrial revolution were the textile factories, in, um, new, mostly in New England. But we had some in Chester County. Uh, the textile mills in the 1820s and 30s actively recruited young white women from New England farms and was one of the first opportunities that young women had to work outside of the home for wages. And the most famous of these were, were the Lowell Mill girls who were valued for their ability to work hard for long hours at much cheaper rates than men. Um, and since they were working with textiles, they were still technically doing women's work. Um, they worked hard to maintain their moral reputations despite their independence. So that was kind of a transition period uh, in those first, first mills using local um, girls. And this is a pretty idealized vision of what those young women, well-groomed, well-dressed, look like attending the the looms, uh, this is probably a little bit more accurate just because you can see the size of the machines they were working with. Um, what you can't tell from this image is um, that they became increasingly <coughs> crowded and very hot conditions. The air was filled with lint. Um, they basically got white lung disease from working in it. Um, you can't see the frantic pace at which the women worked. Um, but you can see that looks like a pretty little girl in the front there. Um, most girls were, so workers were 15 to 25 years old, but there were some as young as six or seven. There's also the noise. The noise. How did I forget the noise? <laughs> deafening noise. And deafening noise. Um, so clearly, um, Rebecca was able to participate in the Industrial Revolution without uh, 
um, in a much different position than these, the Lowell Mill girls. One thing I want people to recognize, um, and I didn't really recognize this myself until I worked on the uh, quilt documentation project at the Chester County Historical Society uh, several years ago. Um, and this is an example of one of the quilts that was brought in from Chester County. Very intricate design, beautiful <laughs> colors, beautiful contrasting colors. Um, but we have to realize that it's the Lowell Mill girls who are producing the fabric at a um, cheaper prices and in much more abundance and you know beautiful prints and, and colors that are attracting uh, the women of leisure who um, no longer have to card and spin textiles themselves at home. Now they have the leisure and if they're wealthy enough the ability to buy these gorgeous fabrics and then spend hours and hours and hours putting them together. Um, it also helped to fuel, that fabric also helped to fuel the uh, fashion industry as well. Uh, I'm sure, go ahead. The cotton boom and slavery in the South as well. We're getting there. <laughs> I had a hard time like getting the organization right. We, we, we will definitely do that. I'm sure that most women at the time were able to take advantage of this. Um, this uh, element of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, increased immigration was another pretty powerful force during Rebecca's uh, lifetime. And um, it's not, I don't, I don't think it's uh, unfair to, to point to the Irish immigration at this time. That was definitely the, the burgeoning um, population. And the Irish potato famine of the 1840s forced desperate refugees to American shores. Even before, actually, I, I've, I've found out that some of my Irish ancestors came even before the, the famine. Um, so this is, you know, the, the popular image of them, that these are really desperate people. Uh, and I'm sure that most of you are aware that they were discriminated against. They were poor. They were Catholic. Um, and uh, many more more single women came over in the Irish immigration than almost any other immigrant group, um, and they more often landed and stayed in eastern port cities. Um, so they provided even cheaper labor than those um, young white farm girls. Um, they did work in factories, um, but famously they worked as domestic servants. And the first New England farm women. They began to replace those first New England farm women. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a perfect example of, yes, immigrants can take your jobs. Um, but the image of those Irish uh, immigrant women um, was pretty poor. They were ridiculed constantly. They were dumb and um, pathetic, but they were the most popular source of um, domestic help. But they're also pitied, you know, they, they have to raise their children in pretty squalid conditions. So not at all like Rebecca's life. Um, slavery and abolitionism, yes, thank you, Anna. I have teacher friends in the audience <laughs> tonight, I'm so grateful. They're going to keep me honest. Um, so yeah, one of the things that we don't recognize when we see those absolutely gorgeous quilts from the 1830s and 40s and 50s that yes, they're, it's fueled by those textile workers <coughs> in the New England mills, but it's also fueled by the um, African American enslaved women who are working in the cotton fields. Um, those forces of industrialization that provided some women with factory work, they're more prosperous sisters with leisure and inexpensive fabrics also forced more enslaved women into backbreaking work in the cotton fields that fed those textile, textile mills. Uh, enslaved women worked alongside men and children in the fields and kitchens of their masters. Uh, enslaved women mothered both their own children, other 
enslaved women's children and white children. I would say they struggled to raise all those children. Um, by the way, Rebecca had six or seven children, six, six lost two sons fairly early, um, lost a daughter in childbirth. Um, I, I would put her kind of right squarely in the middle of the, the demographics of the time period, that that was about the average number of children that most women had at that time. Um, so in that way, she was fairly typical. Um, but she was, I, does anybody know what kinds of um, help she hired in her own home or on the farm? Were they mostly local farm women? Um, were they Irish domestics? Were they free African Americans? Because there was a pretty decent population even this early. So I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't tell. I, I looked at some census <coughs> records and couldn't tell who she might have employed in her own house. But wealthy women at the time definitely were able to employ help. And then there's a very interesting new study um, about the participation of white women in the South and their active uh, ownership of slaves and um, how much they were invested in the slave economy. Yes, like this woman here, probably they were supervising their servants in their homes and kitchens and nurseries, but they also bought and sold enslaved people, administered physical punishment. Um, there are some cases of entrepreneurial women in the South, entrepreneurial in maybe similar ways to Rebecca, who invested in slaves and who uh, tended to take the, the women and children who were devalued by male slave owners um, who went on the auction block much cheaper than uh, you know healthy male slaves um, that they some of those women invested in those women and children because they saw a long-term payoff um, later on so that is a new way of looking at uh, women's participation um, so are, is anybody familiar with the Parker sisters here in Chester County it's a great story. Um, hmm, I forgot to put the date in here. I don't remember. Uh, but there were two young girls. One was only 12, I think, at the time, and her sister was 17. They were kidnapped at two different incidents, but in, within months of each other, and taken south of the Mason-Dixon line. They were working on farms here in Chester County, and they were kidnapped and taken to Baltimore. Um, the youngest one was sold at auction in Baltimore and taken all the way to New Orleans. Um, her sister was actually rescued before she got to the, um, to the auction in Baltimore. And uh, her white neighbors actually um, orchestrated the, um, the rescue effort and her employer, I think his name was Joseph Miller, was murdered in his attempt to try to rescue her. Eventually, the, the, the neighbors got the little girl in New Orleans back, too. But it just shows you how close Rebecca was to some of these big issues um, in antebellum um, United States. Although Pennsylvania had outlawed slavery, women like Rebecca lived very close to those slave states like Maryland and Delaware. And free people of color had long lived in Chester <coughs> County. Um, but even the, the Parker sisters show that they could not escape the specter of slavery. Has anybody seen the new movie, Harriet? Yeah. Um, it's just another example of how I think we've underestimated the remarkable mm -hmm. career she had. And she was close by. Um, you know, she's like the most famous runaway slave woman um, who came up from the Eastern Shore and landed with the help of um, Underground Railroad in Philadelphia. Um, but then she went back many times to rescue um, enslaved members of her family and neighbors. 
um, led them to Chester County and after 1850 um, often took them all the way to um, Canada. So I'm sure many of you are aware that Chester County was a central way station on the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. and that Rebecca's fellow Quakers, men and women, were actively involved. I don't have any evidence that despite the fact that Rebecca was um, <coughs> the member, a member of a Quaker meeting and her neighbors were super active, some of her Quaker neighbors were super active in anti-slavery society, I don't know if she endorsed it, whether she might have um, donated money to some of these organizations. I can't find her name on any of the lists of uh, the most prominent anti-slavery society um, in the area. Um, but obviously some women, a few women were uh, very actively involved in uh, abolition. Obviously, uh, one of the most famous was Harriet Peacher Stowe. Not a local girl, um, but she published Uncle Tom's Cabin in uh, 1852. And, but she was just one of many women who devoted a lot of their life to um, fighting slavery. She went on to be, you know, a very successful novelist. She published a little bit before she um, published Uncle Tom's Cabin, but not a novel. Um, and she used the proceeds from her her novels, and especially Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the most uh, popular book next to the Bible during the mid 19th century. She used the proceeds of her um, books to become an entrepreneur in her own right, and she ran a fairly large orange plantation down in Florida after, after the Civil War. So there are many other examples of women entrepreneurs during this time period. Um, Lydia Pinkham comes a little bit afterwards, but she, you know, she, she had a wildly successful um, patent medicine uh, business. Uh, <coughs> Lydia, Lydia Maria Child, let me check, uh, had Godey's Ladies book. There were lots of what Nathaniel Hawthorne called scribbling women, women who published very successful novels. Um, Ma Margaret Hogarty was the bread woman of New Orleans, a successful baker. Uh, Miriam Leslie changed her name to Frank Leslie after her husband's death, and she ran his publishing uh, empire. So I think that Rebecca is pretty extraordinary in um, building this business and then keeping it going after her husband died. But I don't think she's alone. I think there are other examples of pretty successful women. Okay, so this last major <coughs> force um, during this time period, basically Rebecca's life is 1794 to uh, 1856, I think. Um, and one of the big political um, forces during this time period is the expansion of the franchise for men. It, for the most part, men of property were allowed, white men of property were allowed to vote for um, the 1830s, but by 1850s, I think there was all, all but one state had uh, eliminated property rights for voting so that white men, whether they were poor, middle class, owned property or not, were allowed to vote. And this is <coughs> a, a famous image of how active politically white men were during this time period. Um, they enthusiastically participated in election campaigns. Um, they were active in a lot of party organizations and volunteer organizations, voluntary organizations. 
1841 of the estimates is that 79% of eligible white men cast a vote. Mm -hmm. Compare that to, you know, we hover around 50% right now. Um, but it was a, a dramatic change in kind of the atmosphere of the politics. White men led active public and civic lives. <coughs> so, since men, white men, are becoming much more active politically, um, it actually dawned on some women that, oh, maybe we should be part of this as well. Women were politically active, but not in um, party politics. They had a lot of uh, pu public activities in church groups, Moral reform societies was a popular one. They rescued prostitutes and famously went out and took names of men who were um, uh, <laughs> clients, customers, <laughs> yes, um, and published them in the newspaper. That was pretty bold. Oh, shame. That was a pretty... Uh, politically active thing to do. Temperance societies, I think a lot of us are familiar um, with temperance, um, fighting the evils of alcohol. Lots of other women were working for the poor, the disabled, mentally ill, and prisoners, as well as this huge group that was, um, or dedicated group, I want to say, that was working on the abolition of slavery. And the expansion of men's political power made women's lack of voting power more grievous at this time. Um, <clears throat> one observer of American society at the time was Alexis de Tocqueville, and he was a Frenchman, a kind of a sociolo sociologist and journalist, and he was a very astute observer of uh, American culture at the time, and one of his famous observations of women, he was particularly um, interested in the status of women in the new democracy. But he noticed that, according to him, that unmarried women had a lot of freedom in the United States, but that once they became married, they had uh, a lot less freedom. He even compares it to, you know, in the home of her husband, it's as if she were in a cloister, um, that she was denied uh, a lot of the freedoms that she had before. Um, he was pretty good at <coughs> recognizing that um, he saw American women had a lot of privileges, but that they also had um, disabilities that, they, that women did not suffer in, in France at the same time. So one of the uh, important changes during this time period was despite this kind of grim outlook for women about losing their, their freedom once they were married, that um, this ideal of companionate or affectionate marriages came to be the ideal in early 19th century. Um, you married for love for the first time uh, in American history, um, not just for convenience or support. And I think Rebecca was lucky um, and seems to be an example of a woman who was able to choose a husband for love. That's what she says in her autobiography, that was kind of love at first sight. It also happened that she found a man who was um, a physician and could support her. And I think what's even more remarkable is that he chooses to come and live with her family and to run the iron mills. <coughs> um, so he gives up his career to help support um, her family's business. That seems pretty unusual. Um, although my husband is sitting in the back row, and that's kind of what he did when I got my job at Westchester University. So, despite this, you know, adorable picture of this uh, companionate marriage, um, outspoken women, and Lucretia Mott is from Philadelphia, she's a Quaker, 
uh, Sojourner <coughs> Truth um, is from upstate New York. I can't remember if she became a Quaker too. I kind of suspect that she was. But those women who were working on abolition were the first ones who began to realize that maybe women, especially white and wealthy women, shared some of the disabilities of, um, of slaves. Um, and they became the first pro proponents of women's rights. Abolitionism was very radical, very unpopular. Women's rights, advocating women's rights was even more radical and more unpopular. Um, the, the local Quakers, um, Sadsbury meeting, I know had some anti-slavery societies where men and women met together. Those were called promiscuous assemblies because men and women were like sitting next to each other and talking to each other and making plans and raising money together. Um, one of the local Quakers, and I think it was Abraham Pennock, but I'm not positive, um, probably represented, you know, he, he definitely endorsed women's equality and uh, in, in Quaker theology, they take, I think it's Galatians 1.16, I don't remember exactly, but it's, you know, the, it's the scriptural verse that says in Christ there is neither slave nor free, there's neither um, woman nor man, all are one in the sight of God. Uh, Quakers took that much more seriously than most other Christians at the time. So even a Quaker man who was an abolitionist, who sat in meetings with uh, women and planned anti-slavery activities, and he endorsed women's equality, even he did not want to go to the extent of publicly working towards women's rights. He and many other uh, abolitionists put the priority on freeing slaves and then we'll work on uh, women's rights. Mm -hmm. It was just too, un they, they felt like they would sabotage uh, the abolitionist movement <coughs> if they added women's rights to it. I think that Kelly Foster, that was her, her opinion. Yes. Yeah, she was, they were constantly trying to get her women's rights and she said, no, this is first. Yeah, yeah. Then we'll move on. Politically savvy people mm -hmm. who said, no, we cannot work for both of these at the same time. We're going to work for uh, abolishing slavery first, um, but that did not stop some very extraordinary women um, from working for both. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sarah and Angelina Grimke, they are two extraordinary women who grew up in a slave owning, wealthy slave owning family in Charleston, South Carolina, um, and just became disgusted by the slave system that they benefited from. That was pretty extraordinary and pretty unusual. They <coughs> escaped almost like slaves. They came north and um, joined the Society of Friends in Philadelphia and began working for abolition. They spoke to promiscuous assemblies and they wrote and published pretty radical um, abolitionist tracts but they're really extraordinary because they began um, promoting women's rights as well. In fact, they were so radical that uh, they were expelled from their friends meeting because they were advocating for women's rights. So I just want you to realize that <laughs> to expect that Rebecca would be, even though she was an extraordinary woman and a wealthy woman and a member, an educated woman and a member of uh, Society of Friends, that does not mean that we could count on her being so radical that she would have supported either abolitionism or um, women's rights. Um, I love the, uh, this image of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who of course is the mother of uh, women's suffrage. But the, um, this image here shows her as just this doting mother, and she's, she's hardly threatening at all in this image, even though most people thought she was extremely 
<laughs> it's threatening. It's the ideas that they're threatened by. Exactly. The so the, the Declaration of Sentiments was the document <clears throat> that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass and I think Gabby Kelly was there mm -hmm. and Lucretia Mott created in 1848, modeled on the Declaration of Independence. But I love the, the you know, headline here, Insurrection Among <coughs> the, the Women. Um, among the grievances that they had was that married women such as Rebecca were civilly dead. They had no um, legal standing to represent themselves in court or to defend their property um, or their wages. Their husbands had uh, the right to their property or wages. Uh, unless they could um, negotiate some kind of contract <coughs> before they were married, sort of a prenuptial agreement, but to protect. <laughs> Sometimes if they were wealthy women, their fathers would work to create these contracts because they did not want some irresponsible young man to marry their daughters for money and then squander the money. So there were a few protections that wealthy women could have. I don't know if Rebecca had a prenuptial agreement with Dr. Lukens. Um, but basically, the, under the law, a husband was a master in some of the same ways that um, masters had uh, control over slaves, could deprive slaves of property and punish slaves. They could do the same to their wives. In the case of divorce, husbands retained their custody of children. Um, <laughs> Single women with property were subject to taxation without representation because they had no voting rights and they were not represented, but they were taxed. Um, they could use the same slogan as the uh, American revolutionaries. Most jobs open to women, they complained, paid very low wages. Uh, the professions, the clergy, physicians, or lawyers were um, excluded women. Most colleges, the document actually says all colleges are closed to women, but that's not exactly true. Some were. Oberlin College was probably the most um, famous example of co-ed school and racially uh, integrated. Um, women were denied leadership in most churches that they found pretty egregious. Um, this is a pretty sympathetic view of the convention. Um, there are some that are much more um, uh, sarcastic and uh, character the women. Um, but the convention condemned the moral double standard for men and women, which was a very radical notion. Uh, the most revolutionary proposal that they made in Seneca Falls in 1845, 48, was the call for women's suffrage. Uh, the men and women who signed the declaration, including Frederick Douglass, were truly extraordinary citizens of Rebecca's times. So, I've only introduced you, and very briefly, to a lot of the women who grew up, or who were, um, who were alive and trying to make a living and raise families at the same time Rebecca was in that first five decades of the uh, 19th century. I'm opening the discussion to questions and comments and answers. How extraordinary was she? Mm. Yeah. Well, what comes to mind is that she's in she's an industry. She's in a metal mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. Dirty, physical. Yeah. We call it analog today. Yeah. Whereas the other ladies... A, a masculine industry, yeah. or a heavy industry. And the yes. other ladies are publishing, that's nice, but they're sitting in a desk. Yeah. You know, there's some printing presses involved, maybe. But, right. You know. So she's like, she's the first lady industrious, yeah. I would say. Yeah. As opposed to an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I don't know how, you know, dirty she got and how often she was in the, the factory. Um, <laughs> But she was clearly managing the financial part. Yes. Somehow yeah. she knew how to take, you know, do accounting and and handle the books. Who, I, so. I think that's what makes her most extraordinary. Yeah. That she was handling the financial yeah. end of things mm -hmm. when you know, <coughs> you know, women are civilly dead. They can have no money, yeah. and that well, they're bird brains. They couldn't handle the money yeah. anyway. 
and mm -hmm. more than that, directing the long-term future of the company, yeah. as well as it being, you yeah. know, an industry, a masculine profession. Yeah. Getting loans and paying them back, and you know, kind of establishing her financial mm -hmm. um, credentials. That was really unusual. Yeah. Didn't she learn a lot of this from her father, though? I thought he took her places and sort of sewed into her some of this. I knowledge. can't find any um, specific evidence oh, that okay. say he like he tutored her. Right? He definitely supported her education, but you know, in her autobiography, she kind of admits that. She was kind of a carefree young woman and had this wonderful childhood. Uh, yes, she had an education, but um, she read novels and did, you know, silly girl things. And maybe she could have been more industrious when she was younger. I don't know. That, that you could be right that maybe she. Maybe she learned by osmosis. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like the partnership with her husband was the actually more important than the one with her, um, oh, okay. with her father. Um, so, and she struggled against the, the family, um, who didn't always recognize <coughs> her, her right to do what she, what she was doing with the support of her husband. Yeah, other people want to argue that she's extraordinary. <laughs> Maybe not quite as but unusual. Most, if, if your husband died and you had a business, you just picked up the reins and went on. It was just what you did. If you if, if you, you could. Just what you did, yeah. you could. Yeah. Katie Green, yeah. Nathaniel Wood <coughs> Widow, picks up and runs the plantation. Uh, and I would say that before the 19th century and this domestic ideal for women, <coughs> that they were much more involved, women were much more involved in you know, mm -hmm. running the farm with mm -hmm. their husbands, mm -hmm. um, running businesses with their husbands <coughs> or deputy husbands. Um, and it was only after this ideal of women in a separate sphere that it looked unusual for a woman to pick up mm -hmm. and continue the business. And, and in many cases that accompanied the um, separation of living and working, you know, where e even for farm mm -hmm. and other women, it everything is happening at your house and uh, accompanying that separation of women into this domestic sphere sphere the men's work and jobs are over here you know they move that to a separate location yeah. and house is here so you no longer have you know the apprentices and everybody with you it's more genteel at home yeah. so they're not you know immersed in that day-to-day -day kind of working you know much after you know 1800 1820-ish as say their mothers might have been. Mm -hmm. um, but I did leave out, you know, that still at this time, most <laughs> women, the majority of women, are farm women, right? They yes. are working on family farms and they are, have a lot of responsibility with their husbands um, to raise children. Up until about the early 19th century, um, uh, child rearing literature, parenting literature was addressed to men, not to women. It was the father who was the head of the household. But, um, but you know, they're, they're both taking care of animals. They're both uh, planting, harvesting, <laughs> uh, carding, spinning. Well, um, there's no such thing as women who just stay at home and take care of the kids if you're a farm woman. Anybody grow up on a farm? <laughs> yeah, those are hard, hard-working women, and at this time, still, most women were, were farm women. I thought I remember hearing that uh, her, that her brother-in-law was supportive. I mean, no one tried to take it away. She was allowed to inherit the, the business, yeah, and to continue to operate it. And again, I think that's because it was the the Quakers tend to be more progressive than the general population. And uh, going forward, it was her, her son and sons in law, son -in -law was, yes, who uh, prominent had prominent it. responsibilities in the in the business. So mm -hmm. she relied on men in her family. And and to a certain extent, widows could uh, sort of reassume a civil body yes. legally. Yes, um, that married women 
us We're tonight. Yep. <laughs> However, most widows would not have had the resources mm -hmm. that Rebecca had. Um, they, they would have been destitute or they would have been very creative in ways to make, make money after their husbands died. Or they immediately remarried and that was um, the best way to ensure security for your family, for yourself and your family. In many ways, right place, right time, right thing. Oh, she, yeah. <laughs> she was privileged, right? Yeah. She yeah. was yeah. Yeah. very privileged, yeah. lucky, and yeah. I think she was extraordinary to take advantage of her privilege, but yeah, she was in there. She was in a good place. Other thoughts about how extraordinary she was? I'm looking, yeah. Um, to say something else, I, I think she's extraordinary because I mean I'm a I'm a female entrepreneur business owner and it's hard enough today. Yes, I can't imagine doing it in her time frame. And the other thing that she did, I have other female entrepreneur friends that I can call up and we can commiserate. They they know what I'm going through. I don't think she could have had anybody around her that she that she could sense that real community of what mm -hmm. she was going through or no. what she had to deal with. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So that she's extraordinary for her time and place, but she'd still she be so extraordinary today. <laughs> yes. She was pretty much alone. Yeah. She her was mother uh, ran <laughs> ironworks and owned a lot, uh, a lot of land for iron ore and timber. And when she died, had quite substantial holdings in the iron industry but they didn't get along, so I don't think she could have mm -hmm. gotten advice, but she might have had an example that, of some things to do. And apparently some of the other local iron masters extended her credit, and mm. I don't know if they had a relation with her husband or if they were Quakers also, but uh, were kind and uh, helped her, supported her. So do you know what the what was the friction with between mother and daughter? Because that was the the, the most important opposition, right? I suspect it might have been jealousy. There was a brother that, from what I can gather, was a ne'er do well, and she supported the mother supported him uh, extensively, uh, while arguing about the inheritance with Rebecca. So maybe it was you know the son should be getting this, not the daughter. Right. Yeah. She said That's the mother set the son up in a iron mill that failed and mm -hmm. going through the tax records at um, the archives, he had numerous claims and sheriff sales against them and yeah. the mother bought the iron works back at a sheriff sale, which I think was just a way of writing off his debts. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's also important to recognize how much competition there was in this inter industry in the beginning, right? It's not like she had some kind of monopoly on um, ironworks here. There were dozens of ironworks in the area and across the country, so that makes it her even more extraordinary that she could compete in this pioneer industry. Well, say she had a unique ability to set prices and know when to hold back mm -hmm. so she had some type of insight that kept her from getting in trouble when the market was going down. Yeah. That's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> Not many people can make that happen today. Yeah. Uh, she, she had an ongoing challenge with her mother mm -hmm. and I suspect it, it, it began when she had a child because in her Autobiography. She mentions that she was she was permitted to accompany her father on business trips. Yes, yes, yes. and That's her mother true. was not happy about that. Oh. And I think I think some of that was uh, Rebecca was clearly her father's favorite, and mm -hmm. I think that there was a little bit of jealousy there. Mm -hmm. um, I think her mother must have been extraordinarily intelligent as well, mm -hmm. but. Her mother did not actively run the businesses that she owned. In fact, her father 
didn't. Mm -hmm. He invested and he was quite wealthy and owned several properties and two iron works. And um, part of the problem with Brandywine Iron Works, the reason that he encouraged Rebecca and her husband to come here and run it, is that he had started it with a partner in 1810, and by 1815, the business was not going well. Whoever was managing it and actually operating it mm -hmm. was not doing a good job. So her father wanted her, his son-in-law, to take over and fix it, which he did. But with Rebecca, <coughs> her mother had to be an awfully smart woman. But she herself didn't want Rebecca to run the ironworks and felt that it was not proper for a woman to do it. Right. So while her mother held on to those investments for quite a long time yeah. and supported baby George, the youngest, when, she, when her mother died, the mother left the bulk of the, her estate to George, mm -hmm. who was the one that... Least responsible. Uh, least yeah. responsible. Yeah. And he turned around and then once again challenged Rebecca's right to own and run the uh, ironworks. But the mother was smart enough in her will when she left the bulk of the estate to George. She did it in trust. He got an annual allowance. So she knew... She wasn't just going to give him everything. <laughs> she was smart enough to know he had already failed at so many things. She basically put, you know, a man in his 40s with a trust income. Yeah. She was very, very smart. And, so, and, and women <clears throat> were constantly trying to figure out how to protect themselves, yeah. no matter how wealthy they were or how poor they were, how to protect themselves from irresponsible well, husbands or alcoholic husbands. And yeah. How extraordinary was Rebecca? Another thing that she did was her father died and didn't clearly leave the ironworks to her like he promised. He put it in a codicil that wasn't outright and she was challenged. Her husband died without a will mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Rebecca's will is quite extraordinary. Her two sons-in-laws were executors of her will, and yet she left separate funds to each one of her daughters, and it's written in her will that their husbands have no control over the funds that she specifically left to the daughters. So even though she trusted them enough that they were the executors of the will, yeah. she was still protecting her daughters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was right at the time when uh, <coughs> women were <coughs> lobbying for Married Women's Property yes. Acts, right? 1840s, well, 1848, the Pennsylvania legislature passed a thing that if if someone died intestate, half the estate went to the surviving spouse and half the estate was divided among the surviving children. Not just and men. this was yeah. revolutionary. Mm -hmm. However, in 1852, there was a change of political power in the legislature and they <coughs> rescinded it. Oh. And it didn't easy come, come, come easy several go. Several years yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Freedom, how yeah. <laughs> exactly. so it um, <coughs> the inference that I take away is that um, Rebecca's mother prefers to stay in her sphere, resents her daughter for stepping out of it, that Rebecca <coughs> herself is very comfortable with that and makes it possible for her daughters to do the same if they choose. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether she's abolition, you know, pro-abolition or not, I would suspect that she is probably barely certainly, if, if not in favor of women's property, but in favor of women's suffrage. I, mean, um, I would say, yeah. given her position, the evidence would point us yeah. in that direction. Yeah, given her position, she should have been in favor of <laughs> these women's rights. Yeah. But I haven't read her bias. Wasn't she involved in one of the elections? Uh, 
was there a story about her making signs and yeah I I, have, I haven't found the documentation on that but Skip Houston said that she actually lobbied for tariffs because during the economic downturn in the 1930s <coughs> she says 1830s she says in her in the legal statement that she wrote about the company that um, it cheap, poor quality iron was being imported, leaving home businesses like Brandywine without the protective tariffs. And she did, she and Solomon <coughs> not only gave their workers time to march in protest for it politically, but provided the banners. That's one of the things that she mm -hmm. said. Now, um, Skip said that she actually went to Washington and lobbied but I don't have that information. But uh, industrialists had to be politically active to protect their industry, right? They couldn't just take care of the um, business without being politically astute. <coughs> cool. Any other comments on Rebecca or her Times questions? Yeah. <coughs> Was Rebecca ever under threat of her life? Not that I no. have being, read. Being outstanding in a lot of different areas. Yeah. You mean, was there enough animosity against right. her? Um, <coughs> not that I have read, and, you know, I think she was a good employer, and she didn't make enemies, even though, except for her mother, perhaps. <laughs> um, <laughs> and brother. And brother. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think she <coughs> got away with. Probably more than other women because of her good reputation. Well, Solomon resolved that. She lived in an era with no antibiotics. True. She, she could have starved. She could That's have what killed her husband. <coughs> she could have Black. died. Yeah. Yeah, she could have died of uh, any infection. Yeah. And working, uh, you know, in those days, you didn't live on the, on the beautiful mansion, and drive to the work. She lived where the she work was. At the, work. the steel works was at the bottom of the garden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, all the pollution involved with that and the danger. I'm sure she walked through the factory more than once a week. Yeah. Oh, um, I think she was more than that. And I think we're talking about her as yeah. if she was just a financier, like she's an accountant sitting in an office. I think that's a completely mm -hmm. misrepresentation. She's <coughs> down there saying, you know, people are saying, if we keep making nails, we're just going to be like all the others. Yeah. And she says, well, what are we doing? Somebody says plate, and she says, right, I'll look into that. And she knows about it, because yeah. she's in the business. Yeah. And she makes these major decisions yeah. to, to manufacture plate, yeah. to well. increase the size, to do all this. And, and this is her success. Yeah. Her and husband is the one that started the plate. But she's got to continue it. Oh, yes, she's got to absolutely. How, what carbon do and we put in? I, she un Chester County has had several women that, like her mother, owned ironworks, so they were, could be considered iron masters. But Rebecca is really the only one that physically was involved in the day-to-day -day operations. She's Her mother awesome. didn't run the ironworks that she owned for mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. yeah. she, she hired other people to do it, in the same way as Rebecca's father had done that. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in the mill day-to-day, -day. Mm -hmm. he was an investor. And yes, she grew up in a wealthy household, and she was probably wealthy most of the time. The difficulty when her husband died without a will is that they had just spent a fortune refitting the ironworks to roll boilerplate, and then had to deal with the dam breaking down in a spring flood, so they had to repair all of that. Mm -hmm. So they were heavily in debt because everything was invested. I wouldn't say that she was even, at that time, poor. She was cash poor. Yeah. But Rebecca had... I'm well, guessing she did not have a lot of leisure time to allow her to live up to that ideal for wealthy women. So in my opinion, looking in the balance, I still think she turns out to be a very extraordinary woman 
comparing her with everyone else. Yes, there was a lot of the same factors were um, influencing her life, um, but still, she's she's very extraordinary, mm -hmm. remarkable, extraordinary. Here, <laughs> here. Thank you very much. <laughs>